Welcome, everybody. I'm Lorraine. I'm the CEO for the Silent Foundation. And uh, this is the second in this year's winter seminar series. We're kind of calling it winter. I know it's snowing in parts of the US. The daffodils are coming up in Scotland, thank goodness. So it's spring with us. Um, really excited to be welcoming our um, two of our two very special guests today. We're going to talk to you. Uh, I'm just getting... Okay, sorry. Thanks, Matt. Um, a, so we've got Kirsty Lawrence and Lee Guttridge are going to be presenting today. It's super exciting. This is, you know, this this seminar has generated a lot of interest, which doesn't surprise me. Um, <coughs> Kirsty and Lee are going to co-present. Kirsty's going to start off with an introduction to the cyber trackers. So what's this all about? This this network of global uh, tracking experts that they that they that they work with. And then Lee's going to present second, and he's going to talk about his experiences in the jungles of Lao in Saula Range, because he was actually out working with our fuel team in October, no, November, December last year. So really amazing. They're both talking to you from South Africa today. Um, so I'm going to introduce speakers quickly. Kersey, she is currently the only woman senior tracker in the world. Girl power, just my kind of woman. Uh, you can find out lots about Kersey if you Google her name online. So I'm going to tell you something that you probably can't find out about online. Kersey told me that she recently rode her Harley motorcycle across the USA. Uh, and she described it as absolutely amazing, despite having to sit in the same position for eight hours a day. So, yeah, I can relate to that. That's awesome. Anyway, just another 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 uh, reason to think Kersey's awesome. Uh, Lee? So Lee, I've had the pleasure of meeting Lee personally when he was in Laos last year. He's just absolutely, I mean, fascinating to talk to and really quite a wonderful person as well. He really struck a chord with, with all of our field team. And, uh, you know, they miss him. You know, they still phone him <laughs> yeah, I think daily, probably. It wouldn't surprise me. So he really, you know, he's just a really wonderful character. And uh, we're just so pleased to have him over. Um, he's a, he's a among, among one of the highest qualified guides, trackers and trainers in um, in Africa. Um, you can Google him, so I'll try and tell you something that you can't find out about online. Uh, he collected snakes as a child, so it was his hobby, and his mum forbid him to collect venomous snakes, that was the only rule. One day, she told him that she had found him one of his snakes in the fireplace, so he'd re and then returned it to his bedroom tank. He got home and discovered that he had a cobra. So there you go. <laughs> Thank goodness he's, I think he still has his mum. So, uh, as I said, uh, we're going to hand over to Kirsty and Lee now. Bill's going to uh, join us. Uh, our president is going to join us at the end to moderate questions. And uh, with that, I'll hand you over, Kirsty, if you'd like to share your screen. And um, Thank you very much. Okay, I'm going to share my screen. And let's see how this works this time. All right, can you see my screen? We can. Wonderful, okay. Um, let's see. Slideshow from beginning, here we go. Okay, so sorry about the technical difficulties. We're more used to looking at physical tracks and signs on the ground than bits and bytes and computers. Um, so let me go right away then. In Africa, tracker is an occupation in the hunting and safari industries, currently reserved for tribal men. It's something that all human cultures have historically done for food and safety and some individuals were better than others. Today, some people still hunt for food. Fewer cultures overall retain this skill due to modernization, and some individuals are better than others. Yet we assume that all indigenous individuals are expert trackers, and we assume that all biologists are expert trackers and that tracking is so easy that anyone can do it. So what is tracking? Is it GPS data, DNA sequencing, interpreting the crime scene, scent or sniffer dogs, identifying a footprint? 
Tracking is identifying tracks, whole or partial, fresh or weathered. It's identifying indirect field signs, which include, but are not limited to, everything listed here. Many of the above require some degree of interpretation to identify them. Also gates and track patterns or ways of moving, behaviors, and even particular smells, vocalizations, and alarm calls. It includes track aging, which is vast, and substrate and weather analysis. And it is also using all of the above to follow a trail and find its maker. In short, trackers identify, interpret, and follow tracks and signs to find animals undetected. We do this with small creatures, such as the smallest carnivore in South Africa, the dwarf mongoose you see in the background, and the African lion that you see in the bottom left-hand corner. We also do this with birds, reptiles, amphibians, invertebrates, acts of nature, such as winds blowing grasses and lightning strikes, and even humans. In a broad context, tracking is actually the process of identifying the baseline in a situation or environment, and then being observant of any changes that occur and curious as to why those changes occur. It's something that humans from every culture everywhere have done, and many still do. The process is again rooted in our needs for food and safety. As those needs have been fulfilled by other means, such as farms, grocery stores, brick and mortar homes, eradication of dangerous animals, some cultures have largely moved away from tracking skill and towards other skills, but many still use this process. There are a few cultures that still track animals for food and safety. Today, there is a culture of trackers in hunters, ecotourism guides and trackers, hobbyists, and scientists. Louis Liebenberg, the developer of CyberTracker, says tracking is a new science with far-reaching implications for nature conservation. The story of CyberTracker begins with this man, Louis Liebenberg, in South Africa. Louis dropped out of college. He was going for physics and mathematics to go and study tracking. He did so with the San people in the Kalahari. After he had published his first book on tracking, The Tracks and Signs of Animals of Southern Africa, he was invited to a prestigious lodge in South Africa that had a multitude of really excellent guides and trackers. And the owners of the lodge wanted this man who had just written the book on tracking to evaluate their trackers. The head tracker there was a man named Wilson Masia, and he was legendary for bringing people across the Kruger Park during the time of apartheid when there were man-eating lions that had to be passed by. Louis showed up the morning of the evaluation, and there were 10, 15 trackers possibly there in front of him, and he didn't quite know what he was going to do. How was he going to evaluate these men who had been tracking some of them for 5, 10, 15, 20, maybe even 30 years? And he circled a track on the ground and he asked them to take a look at it and tell, the, tell him what they thought it was. And they stood there and they ignored him. And Wilson stepped forward and he circled a track on the ground. And then he had each tracker go through and tell him what they thought it was. These were the tracks that Wilson circled. And each tracker, these experienced and proud men, went through and they looked at the track. And they came up to Wilson and they whispered in his ear. And they said, steambok, a type of antelope, or diker, a type of antelope, or impala, a type of antelope. And then Wilson said to Louis, now you, 
you tell me what you think this track is. And Louis walked up to it and he carefully moved around the track and bent over and looked at it from different perspectives. And then he walked up to Wilson and he whispered scrub hair in Wilson's ear. And Wilson turned to the trackers and he said, you will now listen to this man because you all have gotten this track incorrect. And he's the only one among you that has gotten it correct. And this launched in the 1990s, the entire cyber tracker system. And Louis co-developed this with Wilson over the years, starting out with tracks and signs and progressing into trailing, which the two holistically form the art and science of tracking. One aspect of the tracker evaluation system is the track and sign evaluation. It's often compared to learning the ABCs of a language, and they are the fundamental building blocks to tracking literacy. Tracks and signs are circled or marked on the ground, and then individuals go through and answer each question on their own and tell the evaluator what they see. Afterwards, there's discussion and evidence is presented for what the track is and is not, and it's a tremendous learning process. The other aspect of tracking, the trailing evaluation, is where you follow tracks and signs to find an animal undetected, like this pride of lions playing with the stick. It is further compared to becoming literate, to forming words, sentences, paragraphs, and stories of an animal's life in the ecosystem it dwells in. The other side of the story, which we're only going to talk about here, is that CyberTracker is also a software where in 1990, Louis was asked by Nate, one of the San trackers, to help them because it was no longer viable to live as hunter-gatherers. And after hundreds of thousands of years, traditional tracking skills were dying out and these people needed jobs. He was asked to help find them jobs. So he and Justin Stevenson, a computer programmer, computer engineer, developed an icon-driven software where even people who could not read and write could push on the icons of an animal and the tracks and the behaviors and the signs, and they could collect data for the park service. It was the joining of two skills, one ancient and one modern. So what's in a name, the name Cyber Tracker? Cyber, or kyber as it's often called, is the Greek root of the word for the navigator of a ship, the person who corrects the sails, who corrects the course of the ship. And they do this by reading all of the tracks and signs of the environment on the water, the winds, the eddies in the water, which birds are flying by or not flying by, the marine mammals, everything is pulled into what they know and they correct the sails by this and keep the ship on course. This is what's known as a feedback loop. You get information and you correct your course based on that feedback. In cybernetics, a feedback loop is also used. This is where sensors, controllers, and other systems pass things back in a reaction feedback to the sensor. Again, correcting what is wrong. And these are the two roots of the word for cyber tracker. And the person that you see here pulling back his bow is actually Nate. That is actually what used to be the living breathing icon of cyber tracker. This is a person. It's not an abstract lo logo. This is Nate. The certification structure is fairly linear. It's an entirely in the field experiential examination. Participants can move from a level one at 70 to 79%, up to level two at up to 89%, level three at up to 99%. And these are the people where we're starting to really, they're starting to really know their stuff and we are happy to employ them or not employ them, but to enlist them as volunteers. And then the professional level, when they obtain 100%, this is the industry standard. These become our paid employees. And this is what we call a secondary evaluation after the secondary 
level of education. Then there's an entirely different evaluation that professional level trackers are invited to. And this is the senior tracker evaluation where again, it's re it requires 100% to pass. Otherwise you don't move forward. And these become our mentors in the system, our evaluators and our assessors. This is what's known as the tertiary evaluation. And it's comprised of more complex questions and more complex trails. There's an honorary accolade that is not earned, but bestowed upon people called a master tracker. And these people have at least 10 years as a senior tracker and have contributed significantly to the field of tracking. If you're familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect, then what we see in the evaluations follows this effect somewhat nicely, where we see on the bottom axis from left to right as our knowledge in the field increases, and then on the axis to the left, our confidence increases from the bottom to the top. So at a level one, we're just becoming track aware. At a level two, we kind of have a false sense of confidence where we think that we know something. Level three, you're somewhere between there's more to this than I thought, and it's starting to make sense. And by the time that you reach professional at 100% on the secondary evaluation, you know just enough to know that it's complicated. This mirrors what some of the data that I found in my PhD dissertation, where on the bottom axis from left to right, tracker level increased and the percent of correct questions increased in track and sign evaluations as compared with evidence provided by camera trapping data. We see this split here, which is the divide between the secondary and the tertiary eval. Remember in the tertiary eval, we're asking more complex questions, choosing more complex trails. And you can see 100% at both professional and at specialist level, senior level, is very difficult to achieve, but these are where our real experts are. And all of this is based, you'll see in the top left-hand corner, on our reference. This is our reference standard, Louis's first book. And this is just a sampling of all of the other books that have been published by some of the track and sign evaluators and high level cyber tracker trackers. And here's some of the peer reviewed literature that has been published in a myriad of topics, including some from my own PhD research. But you will notice in many of these papers, especially the ones put forth by Louis Liebenberg and Mark Elbrock, is that there is a, are a variety of local indigenous trackers listed as co-authors. These people may not know how to read and write, but their scientific accuracy, their ability to work within the scientific framework is evidence. And they are listed as co-authors on these papers due to their traditional ecological knowledge. Recently, Louis published a paper for UNESCO in this, he discusses and describes his experience of working with indigenous peoples to create a standardized and credible system of assessing the knowledge of wildlife tracking and involve, evolving this into a system of cert certification that has international validity. And this is what a typical tracker looks like today. These are some of the San people, no longer wearing skins, no longer shoeless, no longer carrying bows, but actually functioning with computers, with technology, contributing to science, contributing to land management. Tracking is not something that is primitive anymore, even though many people think of it as such. It has grown, it has modernized, and it's bringing jobs to people in the modern day. And of course, Cyber tracker, these are our major hubs of cyber tracker right now where we're branching out. The parent organization in Africa, then tracker certification in North America and all across Europe. 
Our Cyber Tracker Senior Tracker Evaluator team in this project are myself and Lee, Matt Nelson, and Preston Taylor. Note that we're all Senior Tracker Evaluators because it takes that kind of commitment, that time of dedication to the craft to be able to not only recognize what you're looking at, but to be able to teach it to others and to identify others that might also have this skill. I wanna note here that this work, and hopefully you see this, aligns with the spirit of Cybertracker Conservation's co-founder, Louis Liebenberg, and his original goals to find, certify, and empower local trackers and to help develop a worldwide environmental monitoring network. So our trident of recovery and research here is trackers, scent dogs, and DNA. This paper that Louis wrote is on how humans evolved to track down animals for food at a run. And this is called the persistence hunt. Tracking skill among humans decreased with increased reliance upon dogs. However, the combination of trackers and dogs and DNA is more powerful than anyone alone. And I'm gonna hand this over to Lee and he can tell you more about that and his experience in Lao. Yeah. So yours is here. Hi, hello everybody. And um, yeah, thanks so much for your patience with us. The, uh, oops. the, the technical difficulties seem to continue a little. <clears throat> there we go. All right, hopefully this is all uh, up and going. Yeah, so my presentation is a little bit about the trackers in the jungles of Lao. And, and as Kirsi has so eloquently explained, um, we've come out there as rep representatives of the Cyber Tracker Conservation Organization. Uh, we are all trackers and we, we've dedicated in, in some cases, the last 20 or 30 years of our lives to, to being trackers. And being in Laos was just incredible. The diversity, the beauty of the wildlife, uh, the botany, the bird life, the sounds, the night sounds, it was absolutely incredible. Um, in this image, you can see uh, a beautiful impress tortoise, an image of a young saula, which sadly, I haven't seen one yet, but I'm hoping we'll see one soon. and this uh, beautiful Raphalesia, um, which in the, the local Lao name is Katong Musi. I believe that means something like the monk flower. But these are a parasitic plant, but an interesting plant that grows on the forest floor, and they're absolutely magnificent. As we all know, in the Anamites, there is currently an issue with poaching. And very sadly, this was something that, that we got to see firsthand uh, lines of, of poachers' snares set up along the, the ridges of the mountains. It's quite something to witness this firsthand. It's one thing for someone to tell you about it, but to be climbing along kilometers of fence and, and structure made out of, of wild woods and bamboo to channel animals through snares, it was really quite impactful for me to see this. As we entered the, the Pusiton uh, Wildlife Conservation Area, it's a special area preserving uh, endangered species. Um, there were signs upon the, the trees there, and I, I was a bit shaken to see a little further along that there were other signs that were written in Axon Lao in the, the language of the Lao, uh, the Lao people. Um, and this, as far as I understood, basically said that irrespective of the rules, people will hunt here. And this was almost like a, uh, I don't know, almost like a comeback from the people that were poaching. I found that pretty disturbing. Other areas had already been burnt and slashed and cleared. Uh, Rob Timmons, the technical director of the Stala Foundation, was astounded to see these areas deep in the jungle that had already been slashed and burned and cattle had been released into some of them. So that was quite amazing. Um, and these are recent changes. In fact, there were even houses that had been built, clearly temporary homes, but these were places where people were staying 
in the jungle. And of course, we all understand that these are things that are going to happen when people are farming and, and um, agricultural land is needed. And I'm sure this has been happening for many thousands of years. But this is certainly uh, one of the many things that is putting pressure on animals like the sala. When I was out there, I was given a beautiful little book with um, amazing pictures of the wildlife. It was all in the Lao language, so I didn't, I wasn't able to read much of it. Um, but all of these animals fall under that umbrella of conservation and protection that the saula can bring. Um, this is not only about the saula. In my mind, it's about this whole incredible interlinked ecosystem and, of course, the wonderful mammals that are there. In fact, these are some of the camera trap photos that I was given by Bill Robichaud just to show in this presentation. I mean, just incredible creatures, powdered leopards and sterols. And, oh, man, I, I just wish these animals were, were able to live in the numbers that they should in this incredibly productive environment. And I guess that's all part of this process. So going into the jungle and looking for the tracks of an animal like the saula, uh, there was a small problem. There was a hiccup. We didn't know what solar tracks looked like. So at some point, there was a decision taken. And of course, I'm sure lots of, um, lots of favors were called upon for us to get access to a solar that has been in a freezer in Vientiane, um, a dead specimen, of course. I don't think they'd do that to a live one. But um, this solar has been kept in a freezer for, I think, about 12 or 13 years. And we got access to it and we managed to um, take a good look at the hooves and take a, a careful, careful study of the size and width and breadth and length of, length of these, these tracks, uh, these hooves. And then we could even create our own replica tracks. So what you see here is the type of soft uh, clay almost, which will harden with time, that we press the hooves of the animal into to give us perfect tracks as they should be on the ground. Of course, you've got to take into account things like the fact that the animal's weight is not represented here. And of course, the slipping and sliding of substrate, which I found was an incredibly important factor much later on in this process. But if you take a look at these hoof prints, the top left foot is the front left and the top right is the front right. And the outside hoof seems to curl around. And, and we don't know whether this is a common feature to every sowler that's out there. Of course, it could be individual variation, but it was fascinating to see that. And then if you look at the lower set, the left and right, these are the hind feet, you see the reverse, you see the inside hoof that is slightly longer and the outside that is slightly shorter. So this is a pretty cool thing that if this is a common feature to most of the sowler, this might help us to identify this animal. Driving out there was amazing, meandering through the Anamite Mountains on the paved roads, um, looking at the thickness of the jungle and the surroundings. And, and at that time, I didn't even realize that this wasn't even the jungle. This was just some previously cleared land that had kind of grown back in the last couple of years. I had no idea what I was really in for. But anyway, it was a, a pretty good introduction and the, the bendy roads got me a little car sick, but I would soon miss that car immensely. Once we got to our starting point, we started walking into the Anamites. And here you can see the typical sort of terrain we were moving on. The ground was very slippery, made up of a, in this case, a type of mudstone, even though uh, sandstone, granite, gneisses, and limestones are the, the major rock types of the Anamites. This whole area was made up of an amazing mudstone. And you'll see in a few seconds, that I actually take a scoop of this amazing clay out of the bank, which I was thinking, oh my word, this is epic tracking ground. You know, if, if we just get the animals to step on this. Unfortunately, they don't step on it very much. Um, where they walk, it's really hard to find footprints. I also got to know a new animal quite well. Uh, this is an annelid worm. Um, and this particular group is called Hemodipsa. And they are commonly known as leeches. So for me, leeches were a new adventure. It was something I wasn't fully prepared for. But on the way, while we were traveling in, um, we stopped in a small town. And Rob Timmons said to me, Lee, you should get some socks. 
hey, I'm a fashionable guy, so I got myself a beautiful pair of bright yellow socks. I also got some green ones, and I thought, well, this will do the job to keep me protected from the leeches. However, after a few minutes of walking in leech-infested territory, my socks sort of started turning orange. So unfortunately, my attempt to avoid leeches was not entirely successful. In fact, they landed up all over the place. In this little message, you can see a small entry into my, my field diary or my field book. And this was when a, a leech managed to get me on the throat. Um, I thought I'd managed to dodge the bite, but unfortunately I hadn't. And Hamroy pointed it out for me. Uh, this man was an absolutely fantastic colleague in the bush. He kept me alive. Um, every time I slipped or stumbled, there was a, a caring hand to grab me by the shirt. Um, this man is, is just an absolute gem of a human, and, and I intend to stay in contact with Hanoi for a very long time. This is a picture of him on one of the cold mornings, and yes, it was cold. I was absolutely amazed by how bitterly cold it could get during the evening and very early in the morning. Another issue that I had, which I will not, uh, I will hopefully not have to experience again, um, hopefully I'll be more prepared, is trench foot. This happens to you out there. Um, and once it's embedded, no amount of foot powder is really going to make a difference. All you can do is hope to dry your feet. But anyway, I survived. This just shows the typical movement up and down the rivers and, and following the, the water courses, carrying the bags on the shoulders. Um, I must be honest, I was supported heavily in this, but. It just gives you an idea of the terrain we were dealing with. As I mentioned earlier, the biodiversity was absolutely incredible. Um, I, I'm a bit of a fan of absolutely everything. Uh, being a tracker, I look at everything. I'm curious about everything. I love to document and photograph. And the fungus absolutely blew my mind. There were just incredibly beautiful fungi all over the place. The wildflowers were also absolutely amazing. Once again, up here is the Rafflesia. Um, I think one of the common names for this is the Himalayan griff flower, but there may be different types that I'm not aware of. And this little beauty over here is an Assistacia gangetica. And believe it or not, this flower even grows in South Africa. So it's got an incredible distribution. This particular one is called Nguan, and, and that was one of the local language names. I haven't been able to find another name, but I suspect it might be a magnolia of some kind. And apparently, if you eat this flower, although I'm not sure why I would, it will cause death. So there were some incredible beauties, but there was often danger hidden behind that. The insect life was absolutely amazing as well. I've always been a bit of a fan of insects, and one of my books focuses on this subject. But it's amazing how the features and forms are so similar. So this is one of the mantids. We have very similar ones back home here in South Africa. This beautiful creature is one of the millipedes, one of the forest millipedes. And down here is a cicada, which is going to be common to uh, or, or recognizable to people from all over the world. The whole insect vibe in this place was just so different. If you take a look at this huge female firefly, she was moving around on the forest floor, but every time she stood still, she just disappeared amongst all the leaves of the ferns. So what a wonderful adaptation to survive in a place where everybody wants to eat you. There were certainly snakes out there too, and I was surprised by the amount of snakes we saw. I think Rob was also a little surprised by the amount of snakes we saw because we were moving so slowly and with such purpose, searching every bare patch of ground that we could to see if we could find a footprint of this animal that we so desperately want to find. These peculiar structures were also absolutely fascinating to me, and we made pretty good use of them. I'm not sure if anybody's ever seen these before, but these are actually worm castings. These are pushed up by the, the huge worms that live under the ground in the layers of mud of the Anamite Mountains. And one of the days, I actually picked up a piece of this mud and molded a tiny little saula, which my friend Sang can be seen holding here. Oh, man, we, we just 
had an amazing time um, just experiencing all these different things. And one of the really good uses for the mud of the solar, um, of the, uh, the worm castings was for making the ring or wall around a track, which we track casted. So basically what we did was we carried in our backpacks, plaster of Paris, which is a, a white powder that will set into a, a solid structure. And we took samples of all the different species tracks that we could find. So you mix it with a little water, you create a small wall of mud around it using a worm casting or anything like that. And then you gently pour this, this sort of solution of the plaster of Paris into the track. If you give it a little bit of time, it will solidify. And then you have a perfect replica of what you need to see. So these were important because not all of the trackers were familiar with all of the different types of tracks. So once we'd agreed upon a track and, and the species that had made it, we could then make ourselves a replica, which would become a learning tool for all of the trackers that would follow and for the individuals that were with us on this particular trip. It was just great to build up almost like our own library of footprints of the animals of the Anamite Mountains. Here is an example of one of the tracks of a, a Eurasian wild boar. Now, I've got a little ruler right next to it there so we can look at the measurements and the sizes, and that assists us with the identification. But let me tell you, this was an incredibly rare find, to find such a perfect and beautiful imprint in the mud. Most of the time, we were looking at signs, which would be sort of rubbings and scratch marks on trees and places where leaves have been turned over. And when we did find footprints, they were generally into deep leaf litter. So that became a really difficult thing for us to find actual footprints of the animals. When we did, measurements were taken, and not only of the footprint itself, but also of the stride lengths of the animals. So in this image, we were looking at the length of the animal from its hip to its shoulder, which gave us a pretty good idea of whether we were dealing with a large animal or a small animal. And then, of course, with every single track we found, we took records as best we could to try and make sure that we had something to learn from in the future. As Kirsty has already mentioned, the people that we worked with were all from Laos, and they were all people that, well, pretty much all people that had grown up in and around the forests. So finding this way to empower the local people to be the people, the custodians or, or the searchers for the Sala and, and to be the people that are going to find this animal. That was absolutely wonderful. There are some characters here. You'll, you'll meet a few of them in video clips a bit later. But oh, some of them were ex-soldiers. Others were members of uh, teams of, of forestry guards that were going out to prevent poaching. Uh, yet others had grown up in towns. Um, some of these young men had learned how to hunt with dogs and things like that as young people just to obtain food for their families. But it was a real privilege to work with these trackers and to learn from them about their own country whilst having the opportunity to share the little that I know. And of course, in the jungle, I think my mentor must be Rob. Um, Rob Timmons, the technical director of the Sala Foundation was incredible in that forest. Watching him move around and, and just his knowledge of the fauna and flora, the bird calls, absolutely amazing. And, and really, he inspired leadership amongst the team, and it was just great to be a part of his team. Rob and I teamed up to evaluate the skills of these trackers and to assess what they did, how they did it. Um, between us, we very quickly worked out um, who had the strongest skills in identifying the animals, who had the strongest skills in moving through the jungle. And, you know, it was just amazing to, to follow um, behind these amazing, amazing people and have an opportunity, the privilege, actually, of being able to assess their skills and, and provide some feedback to Rob and Lorraine and Bill and Ole and the, the entirety of the Sala Foundation. This is a little bit of video showing Rob trying to follow one of the the track is a, a young man named Yelo. And you can see the look on Rob's face. He's kind of like, wow, I wonder if the silo goes here. I certainly wondered too, but we actually don't know yet. We just don't even know what these animals do. And I love that wry smile at the end there. 
you can see from the mud plastered on my shorts, my ankles, up my socks, my hands, that I had spent a lot of time laying down, not on purpose, uh, mainly because I had fallen off different areas. And this is the kind of terrain where we were searching as well. Quite incredible. The language barrier was a bit of an issue. And sometimes we had to resort to pantomimes. Uh, in this particular little video, you'll see that uh, Li Wang flicks away a rock here. And what we were looking at was that cleared area around that small piece of vegetation. The rock had clearly been pushed away from that area. And we said to Bi Wang, what do you think has happened here? And this is his pantomime or his, his acting out of what he thinks maybe a, a wild boar that had been scratching its head against this tree, or perhaps a young muntjac, uh, one of the barking deers. Um, but at the end, once he'd done his whole pantomime, we said, but hey, man, what about the rock? And he just sort of casually flicked it out of the way, which resulted in a lot of laughter. Because, of course, a Eurasian wild boar is not going to just reach down and flick it out of the way with his hoof. But it was a pretty fun uh, little pantomime. Also, learning about the cultures and, and the traditional activities of the people in Laos was fascinating. This is a demonstration by, uh, by Pan. Uh, he was busy showing us how the poachers set up their snares and was explaining to us the camouflage and, and the way of hiding the, the whole snare system. And you can see he's doing a very sort of quick job here and using some natural vine. Um, and he set up a very simple trigger mechanism. And now at this point, he sort of camouflages and hides away the, the leaf material. Uh, sorry, the, the sticks with the leaf material. And this is basically setting it up that an animal could potentially step on here and be caught. And this is an incredibly effective way of catching animals, as we have experienced in our time in Laos. Really sad that um, snares are so indiscriminate. Um, they don't catch particularly what you want. And we removed all kinds of things from the snares, not only small antelope, which would be good food and pheasants, but also small predators and small primates. We even found a slow loris, which was tremendously sad for me to see my first slow loris and it's hanging dead in a snare. This is just a couple of pictures. A uh, cycam on the left-hand side, an extremely experienced tracker. Um, in fact, as far as I understand from Bill Robichaud, Saikam was part of the original team and, and selected the sites, which captured the pictures of the solar that, that Bill got back in the 90s. So this man, to come around full circle with many more years of experience and, and re-enlist for this conservation effort to protect the solar, this, this was a fantastic privilege to meet this man. And the young man on the right-hand side, Buntian, was a team leader in one of, the, uh, one of the forestry departments. And upon arrival, he was super proud to share with us that he had found what he believed were the droppings of Sala um, some time back. So this is the type of experience we were lucky enough to be able to deal with. On the left here is a, a precipitous log crossing. There were places there that I got pretty afraid and, and I was quite scared about moving over. The picture doesn't really do it any justice, but the way that those logs are resting, there's actually a 20 or 30 meter or 20 or 30 yard drop, which I wouldn't want to experience. And on the right hand side is an example of how we use the track costs. On the left hand side is Hamoy and he is busy using his toothbrush or a, a toothbrush that we've been using to clean up the tracks as his uh, pointer, and he was explaining to us all the different features. So everything that I said, Hanoi was translating into the, the Lao language so that everybody could fully understand what we were trying to teach and what we were trying to learn. And everybody in this team came away enriched and with new knowledge. And that's largely thanks to Hanoi and his sharing of the information that we gathered. This is just a, a little photo of the people that we selected from. There are many characters here that I'm not going to forget very easily. Um, yeah, just such a, a privilege to work with this, this group of men. On one of the days, we had an incredible experience. We found what I believe are 
the tracks of a solar. Look, at the end of the day, there is another possibility. There's an animal called the serral, but we could not find any evidence to really pull us away from the fact that it, it could have been a solar. So we deployed the entire team the next day. Rob took one half of the group and I took the other, and we devised quite a, quite a unique plan to try and locate this animal's tracks further. We followed it up and down hillsides, um, probably only 500 meters forward and 500 meters backwards because of the difficulty of the terrain. But sadly, we could not find any of the dung of the animal. This picture is just myself and the team that found the, the track, and we were all pretty darn excited. Saikam, third from the left, is the man that was probably most excited because he said he recognized this from his early days tracking with Bill. So I believe that animal is out there. We've just got to go and find it. But man, that jungle is hard work. But at the end of the day, if we don't have the poo, which is the gold prize, then we're not going to know for sure. So we need that DNA. That is one of the most important things we need, which is, of course, where the DNA testing comes into play. In Africa, we've got our own problems. We have animals that are being poached to near extinction, like this magnificent black rhinoceros. One morning, I was asked to go and find this animal. So I went out as a tracker and started the process of investigating all kinds of midden sites where the animals defecate, uh, looking for tracks around water holes, and eventually I picked up on what I was confident was the correct trail. The reason we were trying to find this animal was because it had been stabbed by another rhinoceros in the rump, and we wanted to see whether it would require veterinary help. Normally, we wouldn't interfere in wild animal conflict, but if it's an animal as rare as a black rhino, you're not just going to let it go. So I went out, left before sunrise, I picked up on the trail, and I started the process of following this animal. And at that point, we called in a special weapon. We brought in a dog. And this little puppy in front of us here is a phenomenal black rhino tracker. She can be seen there walking with her handler, and I'm not going to mention names or where this was, because these animals are really under a lot of threat in Africa at the moment. But you can see the pace that we're moving over hard, solid ground to try and follow this animal. It takes a tracker to get the trail, to find the trail, to know where we're going to be following or what we're going to be following. And then the dog can take over with its amazing nose and follow through habitat where a tracker might struggle. In many instances, this, this little dog lost the trail. But when she did, I could always step back, go back to my last track, my last sign, and I could do a circle and invite the dog back to the correct trail, and then she would just run off again. And in less than three hours of, um, of running and, and following, we managed to track down and find this black rhinoceros bull for the investigation to see whether he would require any serious help. And this is just a great example of how the tracker dogs can work in conjunction with human trackers. And then once we find the droppings along the trail, which we found plenty of in this instance, we can then use this for the DNA sampling. So this is the three-pronged approach that the Sala Foundation has wisely cho chosen to follow. In fact, in many instances, when we found the dung, we could do a little temperature test and we could determine how fresh the droppings were. In this instance, we've just detected animal movement ahead and the handler is just stopping us for a moment so we can see that we haven't bumped into our, our suspected animal or our, our injured animal. This is just for fun, to give you an idea of where and how we lived. Excuse the half-naked bodies in this one, but this is setting up the hammocks. I spent three weeks sleeping in this little orange hammock. I must say I was super relieved at the end to sleep on a wooden floor in one of the village huts when we were um, heading out. But it was certainly an exciting experience and something that, that I'm happy to do again, and I'm hoping to get back out to the jungles of Lao at some point. See, I was bending back all the vegetation, tying it out of, uh, out of the way of our hammocks so that we had some, some waterproofing above it and getting ourselves prepared for another night in the jungle. You can see Rob on my left-hand side setting up his hammock as well. For Rob, this was like an everyday thing. And after 30 years in the jungle, I'm pretty sure that for him it was old hat. 
But to me, this was a really exciting part of the whole process. We were well fed when we were out there and we had an amazing group of people who we referred to as our non-technical team. In the field, we were pretty much led by uh, Somsai and I'm pretty sure that Zai was our man in the, in the village coordinating what we got in terms of food and how we got it. And these members of the non-technical team would walk an entire day out of the village to go, uh, sorry, out of our bush camp all the way to a village to go and get rice and food like, uh, for example, beef, which they would dry over the fire in the evening. Um, it was absolutely fantastic. That was probably my favorite food in the jungle. The dried beef, is, you can see it drying on, on bamboo here. And there was another little dish that I tried it a few times and, and I needed a lot of water straight after. The, the folks of the non-technical team would roast up some lovely chilies in the morning and that would be part of our field food. This is another little video that I'm going to insert. It's only a, a few seconds long, I guess about a minute. And this shows Somsai with the hat uh, in the center of the screen and his team preparing some, some tables and chairs to make everything in the camp a little more comfortable on our first day when we got there. And just the ingenuity and, and tenacity of these men, you know, just the hard work and, and the support, it, it was really incredibly appreciated by all of us um, that were out there. You can see... Uh, the chairs are made out of bamboo and they're bound together with more bamboo. And the guys were going down into the rivers and collecting massive rocks and packing the whole structure. I often said to the guys that I would love to have them come to my home in Africa and pay them to make a nice garden, a garden furniture set. It was absolutely fantastic. This is just a little image of the, I, th I think more or less the, the management team while we're out there. From left to right, there is Hamoy, uh, myself, with the, uh, with the leech socks on. I managed to borrow a pair later in the, the experience. Then there's Olay, who is also one of our fantastic members handling the management and the technical side of the Sala Foundation. Rob Timmons, who needs no introduction. And then there's Tun, who was out there as a tracker, but also documenting and filming the whole experience. Absolutely incredible young man. And on the right is Sam Sai, who is heading up our non-technical team. This is pretty much the dream team. And here as a, a little parting video is, I was trying to make our way out of a waterfall. And I'm sure that if Rob's watching this, he's going to enjoy this part. Um, I think it must have been a little bit warm. We were all quite sweaty and hot. So Rob decided he was going to take a refreshing dip in the river. I don't know whether it was planned or not, but anyway, just a fun note to end it off. And yeah, we had a great time out there and the spirits and the, the attitude and positivity of all these people was absolutely incredible. And this can only succeed. Thank you for listening. Well, Lee, thank Thanks. you much, and Kersey, that, that was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so just uh, if anybody has any questions, God, I've been going to these forests for years and I have questions, you know, it stimulated new things in my thinking. So that was wonderful. Um, and why, while people get some uh, questions into the chat, um, I just want to say, I hope you, you've seen through Kiersey and Lee's talk, just the incredible global partnership we've put together and the field team we've now put together. And what really strikes home for me, this is, and this is a deeply pivotal moment for wildlife conservation in the world, in the history of wildlife conservation. We are on the cusp of now, after two years of preparation and putting together this extraordinary technical partnership and you know, recruiting these field team members and working out all the technical met methods. We're now on the cusp of 2023 of finding the rarest large mammal in the world and one of the most beautiful mammals in the world and taking the first step to saving it from extinction. And what we've done is with, you know, Lorraine's leadership on the 
and Rob's leadership on the technical team and all of our supporters so far, it's like we built this incredibly um, high performing automobile, but now we need to put fuel in the gas tank and drive it down the road and find cell law. So your support in 2023 to keep team, uh, Lee and his cyber tracker team in the forest and Hamnoy and his team and Rob and his team in the forest is absolutely crucial at this time. We are ready to put this team in the forest in the next few months, but we have to sustain them um, while they're in the forest during the search for the next you know, two years nonstop. So this is a, it's a really impactful time. It's an opportunity for everybody on this call because um, <clears throat> you, it's such a moment and such a species to have an impact for conservation because you know, sow law is one of the most important animals in the world for conservation, yet it's a very small local area. It's not going to be that expensive to save sow law compared to saving tigers or saving, you know, African elephants. So this is a really impactful way that uh, people can really make a contribution to wildlife conservation. Um, and uh, we're so grateful to all of our supporters for the last two years that have brought us to this point. We couldn't have done it without you. And a lot of you are on that call. And so thank you very much. So questions. <clears throat> well, I first want to point out our, our colleague, Mark Newman at the Royal Botanic Garden Edinburgh. And I've had some incredible times <laughs> going with Mark on uh, plant surveys of the Annamite Mountains. Mark is kind of to, uh, Mark is to Indo-Chinese plants and taxonomy that Lee is to wildlife tracking in South Africa. I mean, Mark's the man. And he pointed out that one of that beautiful yellow flower that uh, uh, Lee showed may be the source of strychnine. So yeah, don't eat it, Lee, next time you're out there. Um, Lorraine wants to know, so Lee, next time, uh, what would you add to your field kit uh, other than leech socks? Anything else you'd add? <laughs> sleeping bag line. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> first I would do more training on how to put a sleeping bag liner inside a sleeping bag, not outside a sleeping bag. And I would take more foot powder and use it more regularly. I can see Dollar White laughing at me over there. Thanks, Dollar. Yeah, I mean, still, I think every time I go out, I'm still not to Rob's level. Every time I go out, I think, oh, yeah, I should bring this next time or bring this next time. Yeah, yeah no, there, there, there's a whole list of things, Bill. Um, but I also found that I brought a, a lot of things that were redundant as well. Um, so yeah, a whole kit reshuffle. I think much lighter clothing because I was I brought quite thick clothing, and it just never dried. I, I pretty much stayed dry the whole time. And I think a second pair of sandals would be great because I broke my my pair of sandals on the way in. Um, and you'll see in those videos I was wearing a pair of black running shoes, which was not the intention at all. Um, so I think uh, I, I would figure out how to take better care of my feet. And, and that was definitely the most debilitating thing for me. Yeah, and for those who don't know, the, the, the worst footwear in the uh, forest of Laos are the most expensive hiking boots um, because they get very heavy when they get wet. They got really hard Vibram soles, which might be great in the Rocky Mountains, but those hard soles are really slippery on wet rocks. The best thing wear like the cheapest soft, plastic flip-flops you can find, or, you know, Tiva sandals, really cheap Tiva sandals. And please yeah. feel free, as uh, Lorraine said, if, uh, let's make this a little bit more of a community. Everybody feel free to turn on your video and you can either, you know, raise your hand, ask a question if you don't want to type it in the chat or just, you know, unmute yourself and uh, ask anything you want of Lee, Lee or Kersey. Or any of our team, Rob's here, Lorraine's here. <clears throat> I have a question for both Hello. Lee and Kersey. Yeah. So you you guys, I was looking at, I think in your intro, Kersey, at the photograph of you and Lee standing next to each other. Um, I thought this is like a dream team. And you're, you're you you know, how did you meet each other? Just be lovely to hear a quick story of how you met each other. Were you both trackers already? Or did you sort of grow in that profession together? I'd love to, I'd love to know. That's kind of a long story, so I can try to make it a summary for you. But um, I had just really discovered the cyber tracker system in North America and decided that I wanted to go to South Africa, where the people who developed the system were and learn from them. 
And um, I had no idea that Mark Elbrock, our initial evaluator, was actually bringing the system to North America to remain there at the time. So I could have stayed in North America, but it was very fortuitous for us in a lot of ways that I went to South Africa. And um, I went and I researched the cyber tracker system and I was looking for a guiding school that I could learn tracking. I was looking for a tracking school and I found a bunch of guiding schools and his was the one that just the tracking thread ran the strongest throughout the whole month's experience. So I wrote a grant that was during my master's degree and it got funded and I went to the school. I, I was going to do brown hyena and leopard surveys on one of the reserves in the Eastern Cape and I needed to know tracks to do it. So I went to Lee's school to get certified, became certified, went down there to do the surveys and was evacuated because there was a black rhino syndicate that was operating in the area. And then I went home um, and started bringing study abroad groups back to Lee's school because I was so impressed with the way that he taught and the way that he taught his team to teach. Um, and so every year I just started bringing study abroad, abroad groups back and continuing to work on my own tracking skills, both in South Africa and North America. And eventually we started dating and then I moved here. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot there. <laughs> Thanks, Kirsten. Um, only as a question, um, how widespread is the use of tracking dogs in cooperations? Um, I'm just going to help with a little answer of that. I, um, one of Lee's tracking colleagues is currently visiting me and he brought his copy of Wildlife Professional Magazine. And the current issue is all about using detection dogs to conserve wildlife around the world in various ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, uh, it's an increasingly um, common use of sign detection dogs in all sorts of ways uh, to aid in wildlife research. I don't know if anyone has anything else to add. Yeah, just to, um, to follow on. Yeah, it's it's very prominent here in South Africa as well. And we are finding that, that the use of dogs is one of the best ways to protect our wildlife from poachers. Um, so there's some amazing teams of tracker and, and, and tracker dog that are out there doing wonderful things for protecting the wildlife in South Africa as well. So just to follow on with that, um, I mean, that example that I showed the little video of there is just one of many, many, many dogs that are out there working in the field. Just uh, some little things from this article in Matt's Magazine, just to give you an example of what dogs can do. When searching for bats and birds that have been killed by wind turbines and searching for the carcasses under uh, wind turbines, uh, research has shown that humans find can find about 5% of the carcasses and dogs more than 90%. Wow. It gives you an um, so Yo, who is uh, my daughter's classmate in Laos uh, back in the day, he's uh, calling in, for, I think, from Belgium. He says, hi, Lee, how did the mosquitoes treat you? How did you deal with them? I can't tolerate mosquitoes. <laughs> You know, to be very honest, mosquitoes weren't a huge issue. Um, there were mosquitoes around, certainly, but really not enough to, to deter you, yo. Um, maybe, maybe if you get uh, a chance, you should get out there and do some tracking with the guys from the Sala Foundation, and you won't be bothered too much by the mosquitoes where I was. Um, but I guess Rob would probably be much more of a, a person to ask about that. Yeah, um, I mean, my, my, most most places, as Lee says, mosquitoes are, are not a huge issue. I mean, there, there's certain places at certain times of year, kind of late, uh, late dry season when it's hottest in the forest, and it's and it's also pretty humid. You can get little, um, I forgot the genus, the little stripy mosquitoes. They can get they can get fairly annoying. Um, I've, I've, I've over the years just learned to to ignore them, but I, I guess a lot of people can't. Yeah. 
And actually, I mean, mosquitoes are worse in my home in Wisconsin in the summer because, in fact, mosquitoes actually aren't a primary forest creature. They're more a creature of urban areas and scrub areas. So, yeah, yo, we all had a lot of some mosquitoes to deal up with growing, living in the city of Yangchen. There's a lot fewer of them in, once you're in the forest. And I'm sorry, Uta. I, Uta, I, I didn't have my reading glasses on. I read your name as Uli the first time. So Uta asks uh, now, um, tracking dogs and their owners, are there volunteers or they're also paid jobs? Most of them are actually paid jobs. So we're dealing, our partner is a professional organization, working dogs for conservation, and they have professional full-time uh, trainers uh, with their dogs. So most of these are, are full-time professional organizations now. And, and likewise for likewise for our Lao team, we're hiring. We're you know we're we're offering Lao locals um, careers in detecting dog handling. Um, so so yeah. they're also paid positions. And if anyone is interested who wasn't uh, with us last year, uh, last year uh, we had a talk by our partner, uh, the the executive director of Working Dogs for Conservation, Pete Copolillo. And if you go on our website, um, that talk is archived if you want to watch that and learn about the work of uh, working detection dogs. <clears throat> There's a question about bite marks there. Mm -hmm. There's a, here's a question from Mark, the botanist, to Lee and Kersey, the trackers. Is there one season in which you're most likely to find tracks? I imagine they will be washed away in the rainy season. Goodness, um, that's a really good question. And once again, I, I think that Rob would be much more seasoned to, excuse the pun, to answer that question. But I, in, in the time when I was there, I think it was the beginning of the dry season. Um, and I found it really difficult. We all found it really difficult to find a lot of tracks, but maybe in, in, at other times of the year, Bill, um, Lorraine, those of you that are, are out there throughout the year, maybe you can answer that. Well, you know what? My answer is ask us that question this time next year, because what we're actually going to do is we're going to find out that exact, that, that it, our next two, our next steps in the field program rollout is, you saw briefly, I think it was on Kirsty's presentation, Matt Nelson and Preston Preston uh, are going to join us um, a, sequentially. So Matt's going to come out in July for three months. They're going to overlap in September and work side by side with the field team for a month. And then Preston will stay on for another two months. So they'll actually experience the change of the seasons in Laos and be able to to actually give an answer rather than a, than a, than a sort of educated guess at that question. Because yeah. the truth is, at this point, we just don't know. We do know the one thing is that the sign detection dogs uh, have a much better time of it in the rainy season. Um, the scent is held much better on damp ground than in dry, dusty ground. So that'll probably influence some of it. I'm sorry, I missed an earlier question by uh, Kui Lei. Um, he asks, can bite marks be useful to track endangered ungulate species like Saula? And I assume key means uh, like bike tracks on vegetation feeding sign. Yeah, from, from what I understood through conversation with the, the more experienced of the Lao trackers that I worked with, um, there are four or five specific types of vegetation that, that they thought might be prominent in the diet of the Saula. Um, but I believe when we find more of these animals and we, we get to see where they've actually moved and we follow them, we're going to be surprised by how many different things they probably utilize in the, in the forest. Um, but the actual bite marks them, themselves, the shape of the bite mark, might be difficult to differentiate, I'd imagine, from animals like the Sarah, which is a very similar height um, and may have a very similar diet. So I think there's still a lot of things that need to be learned about this animal and its activities in the field, Bill. I, I, I don't know what you think. Yeah, and I'll just say, uh, actually, Mark Newman, who's on the call, his, he's been involved in helping us sort out. Uh, he helped us identify there is an endemic erasier and aeroid in the Annamite Mountains that, I mean, what villagers say is where you find patches that have completely been mowed by an animal, all the leaves taken off, or most of them, 
villagers say that's diagnostic evidence of Salah because it's particularly favored by Salah. I mean, actually, we've never been able to confirm that, but I'm always watching for this plant and seeing if it's fed on wherever I'm, you know, roaming around the Anamites. I don't know if anybody else said anything to add. Um, I, I think too that um, we discussed with Rob and Lorraine and possibly Ole after Lee came back from Lao Preston, Taylor actually brought up a really excellent question about the DNA and the possibility that if we do find fresh tracks and a fresh trail of Saula from browse material, if there's saliva, for example, or um, the Saula have a very large preorbital gland for scent marking. So if we find scent marking, that we might actually be able to get DNA from that too for confirmation. So, and, and your fellow tracker, Matt Nelson, asked a question. Um, did you find other signs along the trail that you followed that, that you followed that point to cell law, such as feeding sign or marking signs? Yeah. So, so not marking signs, but definitely feeding signs. And I think one of the reasons why, why Saikam was so confident that that was, in fact, a cell law was because the species that were being eaten we're amongst those four or five species that the villagers have told us are the ones they eat. But I mean, if they're good to eat, who's to say a Sarah didn't eat them too? You know, so so yes, we did find feeding sign and and we found places where um, uh, fronds of, of of fern trees a good meter and a half off the ground, like at a good height, had been browsed and eaten, and you could clearly see the feeding sign. Yes. Okay, we'll take one last question from uh, Uta. Uta asked about what, what about wildlife trail cameras using camera traps to find cell uh, And she said, I'm sorry if you already spoke about that um, because she was a bit late getting on the call. Yes, Uta, we, we've, looked, we've been looking at this for like 10 years. Um, and the conclusion of our technical team and our whole team is that camera traps are no longer an appropriate technology to find Sala because the animals at such low density and in such dense wet um, habitat where the detection range of a camera trap is maybe just a couple of meters. And I, um, because you're in Europe, Uta, we can use an example. Imagine there are like 50 chamois ibex throughout the entire French Alps. It's completely covered with forest, and you're going to try to find them with a few hundred camera traps. It's not going to work. So, what we hope to use camera traps for, if Lee and the detection dogs, if they start finding what they think is a local sawa, then absolutely we'll start putting camera traps out and trying to get photographs of that animal, quite possibly. But we really think um, it's our belief that detection dogs are now going to be much more effective than camera traps at finding the initial animals. So again, thank you all very much for coming. This is a great crowd and an absolutely wonderful talk. Um, Lorraine, do you have anything to add before we close? I'll let you, you wrap it up, but thank you everybody. Thank you. Um, thanks for moderating the questions, Bill. And yeah, great crowd. We, we attract a whole range of fresh um, new faces every time we hold a seminar because it's a different topic and it just draws in a different crowd. So this has been absolutely wonderful. Um, so a lot of you are, are newcomers to the Sila Foundation. I put a link in the chat, but you can find us easily out online. Please sign up to our newsletter and you'll get regular updates from us and you can follow our progress. It's going to be a really exciting year because we, we you know, the field team are in the forest right now. Hanoi couldn't join us, Lee, because he's in the forest right now. So that's why you didn't see him today, but he'll be able to watch the recording and I'll send out the recording to everybody who registered and I'll, and I'll, I'll send a link to sign up to the newsletter. So thank you, everybody. Really great to see you all. I hope to see you again. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>